Uh, one of my clients taught me that you shouldn't just ask for the problems. You should ask about um, the things that are going well and okay in their lives. In this video, we are talking with Dr. Howard Lipke about EMDR, spirituality, and many other topics like the preferred emotion, the history of EMDR, and how we can integrate EMDR and spirituality. Dr. Lipke has been practicing EMDR for 30 years. He is also the author of this book, EMDR and Psychotherapy Integration. Uh, and some very interesting insights. Um, so here's the interview with Dr. Howard Lipke. So good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to have you here and welcome to another one of our community events. I'm really happy that we are going to have Dr. Howard Lipke with us this afternoon, and we are going to talk about EMDR and spirituality. Um, there was an article that we had posted in the group, so if you want to get, whenever you get a chance, you can go ahead and download that. But Dr. Lipke has been, <laughs> he just told us, has been a veteran in uh, EMDR for over 30 something years. So we are really happy to uh, just dig around in his brain and learn a lot today. Dr. Lipke. Hi. <laughs> should I start spewing wisdom or uh, should I <laughs> till you ask a question? Well, uh, so so we're talking about EMDR and spirituality, um, you know, based on your the article that is available on your website, which we are going to link to below this video. Um, and I want, to, I want to start by asking you, EMDR and spirituality is not something that is being talked about a lot. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about why. Why is that something that is not being talked about? Well, I, can, I have several different answers. A, a short direct answer is that, um, the way Francine, let me just make a little preface to this. I, I started working with EMDR and, and actually I was, uh, I was a facilitator at my own part two training. And I worked with Francine very early on. And the reason was that um, I found out about EMDR uh, from one of the early articles uh, and we weren't having very much success in treating our combat vets in the PTSD program or, that I was directing. And so this looked good. I flew out to California. I tried it out. Uh, we published a paper on the first five subjects. I flew to California. Francine mistakenly thought that I was going to bring the whole VA with me. And I was just the director of one hospital. <laughs> but she, she tended to be extremely optimistic or extremely pessimistic. And so um, anyway, so I started working with her and uh, I, I really liked it and got it right away because it's it's really a good therapy for people who just don't know what to say because all you have to do is say, oh, start with that. And so um, I, I was fine with that in any case. Um, so, uh, so I just wanted to give some background about why when I talk about Francine and I talk about the development, um, I was involved in helping her uh, work on her first uh, book and, and things like that. So if you look at it this way, so, so I look at it this way, there is a, a problem associative network that the assessment phase uh, questions, you get a picture, you get a, uh, uh, you, you get a belief, you get a sensation in your body, you get an emotion. And, and this is accessing a whole associative network. And it does a really good job. It was really an excellent job, brilliant job she did in bringing and accessing this associative network. Now, the other thing that she did was that she helped create a solution element. And in, in this was the, um, it started out as the preferred cognition and evolved into the positive 
cognition because people like this concrete idea of negative and positive. I think that was a mistake, but in any case, so here you've got this associative network. And if there's this element can get in there, then that, that network is gonna change. It, a lot of it will dissolve. So if a person really believes, let's say they got the impression that, that they were a bad person. And um, if some connection is made that they're a, a good person, then guilt and a lot of other things might, might go away. So as she developed this, she's trying to follow, um, I think, a cognitive behavior path, which she was educated. And now remember, when Francine developed this, she was really uh, very early in clinical practice. And she was brilliant. And she put to, she learned things and put together a lot of things, but um, she had to do it very quickly. Anyway, so the, the solution element was going to be the preferred cognition. And following the logic of the time, the more general that could be, uh, the more I talked about you as a person, the more likely it would be to generalize and be helpful to the person. So this solution element uh, would want to be about a person's characteristic. Now, if we look at uh, Janoff Bowman's uh, work on PTSD in her book, Shattered Assumptions, and I don't know if people know that or not anymore. It's, it's hard for me to know um, the things that I was learning 30 years ago, whether people are learning that or 40 years ago or 50 years ago, <laughs> whether people are still learning those things. In any case, so she talks about that there are three shattered assumptions, that the world is benevolent, that life is meaningful, and that people have self-worth, the person has self-worth. So tra a traumatic experience shatters these. Francine focused on one, good, you know, following good cognitive behavioral practice at the time, self-worth. Now, um, it was very effective. You know, most of the benefit of EMDR is accessing the associative network and moving your eyes. And there's Cusack and, and, and uh, Spates did a study showing the minimal effect uh, of, uh, of the cognitions in many cases. I don't believe that's necessarily true clinically, but there is evidence to support that that's the, the, that can be the least of the beneficial effects. The major beneficial effect is you access, bring, the, bring whatever there is of it forward and move your eyes and you're gonna get an effect. In fact, that's how Francine invented EMDR. She just had people think of what was bothering them and move their eyes and she got great results. But then she developed that even further by adding all these other pieces. Um, then what happened was that there was so much criticism, unfair, just unjust and personal and virulent and a horrible kind of people with academics, would write uh, in discussion lists and call her names, make up fantasies about her and all kinds of just horrible crap. So this had a potential to destroy EMDR. And so she had to try to answer their criticisms as best she could. Um, so what she did, I think, is she reified the thing. And, and so to avoid any uh, suggestion that there was something wrong with it because it changed or developed, she, she cemented it with the cognition about self-worth, uh, uh, about uh, identity, and these other potentially um, curative or healing ideas that, that could have gotten into that associative network, um, such as related to spirituality and religion, and I'm conflating those two. Uh, right, so, so, so Howard, I, I just wanna, make sure that that I follow. So what you're saying basically is that because Francine Shapiro in the beginning, uh, beginning stages of EMDR, it was not accepted by the general therapy community. It was not, um, it was not accepted by the, by the scientific community. So she had to make it very science-based and that kind of stood in contrast to spirituality. Yeah, but right. And so she developed that protocol. Now she left room for it. If processing got stuck, she left room for it in what she called the cognitive interweaves, right. which is essentially psychotherapy with eye movement. So yeah. 
you know, and, and you want to keep it simple and direct if possible. Um, so in the paper, uh, the example uh, that I give with a early client uh, in uh, a combat veteran who's, um, it was the Vietnam vets and it was a long time ago we did this work, but he, he had a friend uh, who, was, who was killed, who was, was, was severely wounded and was certain to die. And he was not near him and there's no way he could get to him without just being shot to pieces. And so, but, he, but survivor guilt and the, the kind of guilt that humans feel doesn't, is not in the part of the mind that's logical or intellectual, okay? That, that's um, in, in our um, other, uh, other memory systems. You know, that, that's where reliving memory is, um, the non-declarative memory. Um, and also there's an aspect to it where, where it's a cognitive belief that's ingrained in you in the service where there's nothing's impossible, you can do anything. So the solution was not gonna come from the idea that he should have, the, the idea that he couldn't do anything, that wasn't working. So uh, asking the question, where's your friend now? And we did a set of eye movements and he had a vision of his friend in heaven smiling at him. Now this wasn't an explicit, um, uh, this wasn't an explicit spiritual uh, intervention, but it was right up next to an explicit one. So I, and so you could do that with a client um, in, in the assessment phase. So if they would pick, what would you rather be thinking when you remember this, it could be that um, something to the effect that uh, God has a plan or um, my, faith, my faith can protect me and whoever was lost. And the That's other thing, so you're saying we can start integrating spirituality into our EMDR work, uh, beginning in the even in the assessment phase, so we don't even have yeah. to wait for phase four for a desensitization. Right. Yeah, and we, go ahead. we could do that. That's one of the things I was wondering because if you know the argument comes up that you know a lot of therapists aren't really bringing it up, so I wonder if during EMDR, some clients feel like maybe they themselves can't bring it up. So they may not necessarily go in that direction during processing. Maybe there's some gentle way that we could inculcate it yeah. maybe in um, well, but, when we start doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And what you're saying reminds me of how to, of the, talking about how to do this. See, People practice based on the training and the training is very artificial. In the training, you develop the assessment questions and then you go right into uh, the processing. In practice, what I do, and there's a, I have a, um, a questionnaire at my website. It, um, it's the GLEQ, the Great Lakes Events Questionnaire. And I give this to clients in my presence if I think they're fragile or take it home and they just fill out, they just put numbers in boxes, basically suds numbers in about you know, 15 or so different uh, categories of traumatic experience, possible traumatic experience. I don't call it traumatic. And so um, they bring that back and I ask them about this and very briefly get information. I don't want them to go too far into the trauma, but of course, when you're dealing with somebody or the client, you let them talk if they want to talk. You know, you don't say, "Oh, I'm sorry, we got to get through this. Uh, we have, we've got to get through this questionnaire, or else we're going to be in big trouble with who I don't know." But so you let them talk if they need to. But usually, it's very brief. And then I have them pick out which of these events would it be most helpful to them if it bothered them less. I don't ask for the worst one. I say, just look these over and, and see. Now there's about 15 of them and there's about four age categories and they pick one and they put numbers in them and they'll, they'll pick one that's severe. And then I will start asking them assessment phase questions other than, um, other than the, getting an image or a picture. Now, remember this is during the history. You may never do processing with this person. Um, 
they they might not be ready for it for a while, but they can tell you what they say about themselves. They can tell you what they prefer, uh, what they would rather say about themselves. And they can tell you, um, I, I ask also for the emotion and a preferred emotion, what would you rather feel? Uh, which is very helpful for a lot of people, especially with guilt, and they don't think they're allowed to feel anything else. So you can explore different feelings, but that's in a paper at, at my website too. So now, as they develop the, this negative self-belief, uh, and then what they would prefer to believe, a lot of times if the negative self-belief is based on uh, guilt, based on, which I consider anger at the self. Oh, here, I can show you my book. <laughs> This is uh, my book about anger, uh, and it has a lot of information about forgiveness and about EMDR and things like that in there. And so, uh, can you say the name of the book, uh, Howard? Please. It's at my website. Yeah, we, we can. We'll put it in the. Uh, don't, the don't, I, yeah. don't I have the right to be angry? In any case. So now I feel like I've done my capitalist uh, duty here. Uh, all, all <laughs> Very good. So this is the Howard's. Other book that was. Published. It's the second book. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's the first book. Yeah. Let me let me give you a warning about that book. There's a lot of it. Uh, the clinical stuff is still good, but the um, the research the, the research on eye movement that's way out of date. Well, so, that was published twenty two years. Twenty ago, years ago. Yeah. 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 But I don't want people buying it thinking that the research in there is going to be up to date. Uh, in in any case, so so. <sighs> As people talk about their negative self-beliefs and maybe their guilt and what they would rather be thinking instead, then you can bring up, they can bring up their spiritual beliefs about forgiveness. Uh, and this is the time to have a conversation about what they think about themselves and why and uh, what they might think about themselves instead and why. And it's a really good cognitive existential therapy. And you've got all the time in the world for it because you're not having to hurry to get to the processing. And this is a, it can be profoundly um, helpful and effective um, to just go over these issues. So um, whereas they, the preferred cognition, what they, might want to believe might be a self schema, but as the conversation uh, is pursued, their negative self beliefs might have to do with I've sinned, I'm evil. And then you ask about what do your spiritual beliefs tell you about when somebody has done that, when these things have taken place and you have that discussion with them. And you just do it in their terms. You don't, you don't try to, obviously, you don't try to foist your own beliefs on them. When Francine talked about EMDR being client-centered, it's profoundly client-centered. And a lot of the questions of diversity in treatment in EMDR are handled by the fact that the client is driving this and the client is in, in every case, educating the therapist about themselves and also about their therapeutic about their um, their personal beliefs. Yeah, so I have a question about that, Howard, and it's one thing that you mentioned in, in the article. You mentioned that one of the barriers to integrating spirituality into our EMDR work is that when the therapist and the client don't share the same spiritual beliefs. So right. why is that a barrier and what, what are your thoughts on that? How we How can we resolve that if, you know, if I have a different spiritual belief than my client? Well, it, it's only a problem if you think that your spiritual belief is a truth that your client, uh, that you can't get away from, that you can't tolerate your client having a different one, and you're not willing to let your client's beliefs um, generate their healing. Uh, so it, it's, but for a therapist who only wants to work in uh, in, 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 rational, in rationality and reason, um, they might have a hard time. So here's an example. Uh, I had a veteran I worked with a, for a long time. He worked through a lot of his war trauma and um, early life trauma. He's involved in different activities that uh, 
were uh, less than positive in the drug world. And we worked through the way these things had troubled him. And so we, we just met, you know, uh, 15 minutes about once a week or once every few weeks whenever he needed to call me. So he'd have trouble with his wife and he'd have things bothering him that bothered him more than he thought they should. And I would ask him, well, what do you want to do with your, your feelings about this? And he would say, well, I'd like to turn them over to my main man, Jesus Christ. And I would say, okay. And we would do eye movement. And he would calm, look at the, look at the situation more rationally. Now, I, I really think that there are wonderful things, that, uh, tremendous guidance from, uh, from the words of Jesus and, and the ideas. But I'm not Christian. I don't have this belief. I don't believe the same way he did. But I had no problem at all with him finding comfort. Now, this doesn't mean that you know, I'm going to be OK with every client's uh, belief. You know, Some clients. Uh, still might come back from the war thinking, um, kill them all and let God sort it out. You know, I'm not going to say, okay, let's do some eye movement with that. You know, it, it's, um, there are some ideas that- We have you know, to have some reasoning <laughs> with this. You know, we have to be reasonable. And, and so in another, another way that you can get to this and use it is on the back of the, um, the, the trauma questionnaire, uh, one of my clients taught me that you shouldn't just ask for the problems. You should ask about um, the things that are going well and okay in their lives. And so I have three questions that get to uh, what do you appreciate about your life? And if they say nothing, you know, what do you value uh, from your accomplishments in the past? And, but the first question is, what ideas or thoughts or beliefs do you try to live by? Yeah. And Combat, and, I, and I've done this not just in EMDR, but in uh, I used to do uh, groups at, at the VA, uh, the, my, my anger prevention group, and we discuss various topics. And I'd ask them this question, having to write, you know, put it on a note card. What what are the beliefs that you have? What aphorisms? What ideas do you try to live by? And these are all battle-hardened combat veterans. And the most prominent response was the golden rule. Um, and then sometimes people would say, well, you know, I don't believe in anything. I don't care about anything anymore. And I might ask them, well, um, do you think it's a good idea to be helpful to people? And they say, yeah. And so I said, okay, so you do have values, you know, that it, when you ask about, you ask them to label it, they don't have it. So when you get this, these aphorisms, these beliefs they try to live by, there will be some, some religious ideas in there. Uh, some yeah, spiritual I'm ideas. A religious idea, and I'm <clears throat> I'm curious about religious versus spirituality. Can they be different? Um, you know, well, this gets to semantics. Um, to me, it's uh, I, I consider religious beliefs to have a spiritual aspect to them, and not also. So, if you if you count religion as a, as a structure and belief system that uh, is followed with orthodoxy. Um, okay, but I, I consider them to the, in my version, that they're all related. And, and the fact is, I don't think I ever met two people that had the same religious beliefs. You can claim that, that, you, that you're, uh, you're this or you're that and you're orthodox. And, um, you know, when you ask two people in the same, uh, with, with, who categorize themselves the same way, they'll even have variations in what they believe. So <clears throat> I think when we try to say, you know, we are spiritual, we're not religious, I think it's almost as if we're trying to soften a blow and let, you know, to say, hey, I'm not dogmatic, I don't hold on to, but they do, they do hold on to a lot of things when you really check, or they see you and they want to tell you, you know, I'm, I'm spiritual, I'm not, it's almost as if it is, um, you know, a politically correct thing to say nowadays, but I'm spiritual, I'm not religious. But you, I agree with you that you can find so much in there that you can still work with anyway. But, you know, Dr. Lipke, this may, this may be beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, but I was also wondering, is there any gentle way to help EMDR therapists 
really, I mean, unless it's really out of their, uh, out of the way for them to do it, to really allow people to have their spiritual, you know, wherever it goes without really stepping in or feeling, or is that feeling like, oh my gosh, this is something wrong. Cause this week twice, um, I I'm book solid. I can't take on any clients right now, but, um, I have people with a lot of trauma, but both of them, um, their sexual orientation as women is that they are lesbian. Right. And I'm trying to get them to other therapists, but I'll, try to give them to the therapist and I'll say, okay, this person's very Catholic because of the way she works. She's going to ask if she want, you want the Catholic stuff or you just want to work normally. And then she was like, oh no, I'm, 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 I'm gay. And I was like, okay, right. So I would have to give her to somebody else because here in, in Trinidad in particular, the religion gets in the way. It really gets in the way. I've had therapists, I've seen their entire website suggest you know, they talk about God's God's place in the therapeutic um, alliance and so on, which is good for who wants that, but may not be so good for others. And once you know, and therapists, well, in Trinidad, I'm not too sure about abroad, tend to have a lot of their, um, you know, iconography on the walls, which sometimes, you know. So I, I think the long, <laughs> the, the short question I'm trying to ask is, do you have like, some maybe like tips for those of us who are in the room and who will be listening about ways we can stay out of the way. Well, I, I think EMDR, the, the structure of EMDR is invites you to stay out of the way. You know, so let's say um, somebody's preferred belief, let's say uh, something bad happened and they're blaming themselves and they think that they're going to hell. Okay. You might engage them in the discussion of what do their beliefs tell them about forgiveness, about what's possible in forgiveness. And, and that's what I'm going for, Dr. Lipke, as opposed to the therapist who'd say, oh, hell, okay, because maybe they believe in hell themselves. Yeah, right. So that sort of languaging that you're about to use there. But the, in, in the therapist, the, the therapists ourselves, um, if we shouldn't practice against what our basic beliefs are if, if we can't uh, let ourselves be centered to the client. It's just, you see, it's just you're not, not your client. And there's plenty of therapists in the United States that especially Christian-based, uh, I think, uh, pastoral counselors that want the solution to be in terms of, uh, of the religious practice. So they're not going to be interested in what we're talking about here. They have their uh, their structured way of looking at things, and they're not looking at, at this. So I, I don't have. I'm not going to try to convince them of anything. Right. Um, so, um, but with the client now, also at my website, there's an article on forgiveness, and it's also in the back of the anger book. And I think um, what might be particularly valuable about that is it takes a different stance about forgiveness. It says forgiveness can be in parts. There's, there's a, a religious figure, a Bishop Butler in the 1800s, I think, or 1700s, who said that there's two parts to forgiveness. One is giving up the anger and one is giving up the punishment. Now, um, you can't give up the anger if you need it to keep distance from a person who you think you could be victimized by. Yeah, but if the anger is getting in your way, if it's being destructive to you and it'd be valuable to give up, then you follow this the path of paying attention to the fear or sadness that the anger is there to block. So sometimes you can give up the anger, sometimes you can't. Sometimes the, pun the punishment is necessary to keep something from happening again, but sometimes not. And so you have to decide whether you want to forgive that part too. See, so when people talk about forgiveness, oh, forgive because it's good for you, that, that's not a very good reason. I mean, that, that breaks down logically. You can't forgive because it's good for you because that isn't, doesn't seem to be true forgiveness. Now, so, but then there's a third aspect of it. What relationship are you going to have with the person that 
partially forgiven or not, for, or, or even if you're unforgiven. And, and that's also part of the discussion. Now, where it gets most important is self-forgiveness. So a lot of this has to do about forgiving yourself. And people, we don't think we have the standing to forgive ourselves. Now, who am I to forgive myself? In that case, it's really important to break it down into the component parts. You know, is the punishment doing you any good? Is the anger at yourself, which I call guilt, anger at the self, uh, doing you any good? And then what relationship are you going to have with yourself? And I think the path to forgiveness there is to change your relationship with yourself. People is hold us. Is, do you mean by change your relationship with yourself? Is that by using spirituality. So one of the things I found the most helpful in your article, you say when processing gets stuck uh, or it, it's not progressing, you say, and this is a quote, consider what your spiritual beliefs are yeah. as you contemplate the situation. So I'm wondering, is that, can we consider that a, a spiritual interweave? So it, it, it's a term that I, I haven't you know, I haven't seen anywhere, but, you know, as I read your article, that's what came to mind. Is that a spiritual interweave? Consider what your spiritual beliefs offer. Well, if you want to get in the labeling business, you certainly could. Um, you I got know. your permission. <laughs> yes. You have all the permission from me that you need from me. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the cognitive interweave, the language of the cognitive interweave is like, it's not necessarily cognitive. You know, it's, it's not a belief necessarily, could be anything. Um, one of my clients, and this has a spiritual aspect to it, when he was most troubled, he would have an image of his grandmother, again, who was, who was passed away and in heaven, and that brought him some comfort. And the unspoken words, I think, were the love of my, grandma, my grandmother will abide me. So you could put words to it, but we didn't think it was necessary. So yes, you could call it a spiritual interweave, but I would generally be in favor of dropping all of those, those designations yeah. and, and, and think of it as what, what's the healing factor? What's the healing element? Yeah. And um, develop that out of conversation, develop it out of what you know about the client. And, um, but I think if you introduce the idea of spiritual interweave, um, that will promote it because it's so important for us to have labels as human beings. And um, so I retract my, my implied criticism of it. Um, okay, but maybe we created something new now, spiritual interweaves. Um, I want us to have that. I desperately think we need them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Howard, before we open the conversation to our community members and, you know, who might have some questions for you, I want to ask you one more question. And this is how can EMDR therapists get better at being EMDR therapists? Um, I think the best way is to concept is how you conceptualize it. Uh, num number one. If you conceptualize it, there's a problem associated with the network and there's a solution element and you think of it that way and break down some of the rigidity of it, that will help. I think the, the other most important part is have a really good understanding of, of what's going on and explaining to your client. And um, I've got a, I'm going to show you what I explain to my clients um, and I draw it for them. There, there's a at the anger book, there's a, a version of this, but let me see if I can do it here. So let's say this is a mind or a brain. Is that visible? Yeah. Okay. And so... Depending on the angle. Okay. So here we got the big circle is um, reliving mem memory. These are when we remember something, it feels like it's happening again. And so let's say there's an activating event occurs, reminds a person, you know, they see a setting that reminded them of the war. It wakes up these undigested, unprocessed memories that are reliving memories. And they feel to some extent like it's happening again. Okay. And there's a whole bunch of stuff over here. 
And the job of that stuff is not to be forgotten. Oh, I got it into the spot. It's to be remembered as something we know happened, we might have some feelings about, but we're not reliving. The distance. Yeah. And so we, we wake this up, we bring up the images, the, uh, the cognitions that go with it, the, um, the feelings, we bring that to awareness, and we have people move their eyes and back and forth, and that promotes it moving over here. And I tell them it's something, something like what probably happens in sleep and dreams. Mm-hmm. Now, so here what you want to happen is, wow, I'm amazed that this is working. Great. It looks great, yeah. A lot of that stuff moves over here is what you want. Now, not everything should be moved. Like remembering how to ride a bicycle, that's a reliving experience. You don't remember, oh, I put one foot up and one foot down. That's the intellectual way of doing it, and then it becomes automatic. So stuff moves back and forth, and it's supposed to. Mm-hmm. But if people are troubled by their memories, that stuff is in here. The goal is to get it mostly over here. Mm -hmm. And if you draw something like this for your clients, it'll show that you really understand from a psychological point of view what's happening. And it lets them have a good concrete view of it. And I I do that in the first session. When people want to know, they say, well, I want to know why I'm having this problem. It's a universal question. I say, well, I can answer that in five minutes. And I show them this and some other stuff about, you know, for anger and how anger comes and blocks emotions that want to come up. And I've got that drawn out in the book and how, um, you know, so, so an event, uh, an event triggers past memories, but it also triggers current emotions too. Right. And if these are digested, uh, it might just wake up the memory of something that happened, but not all of the destructive emotional power of it. And the goal is to move stuff over, and there's different ways to do it. And I don't even bother calling it EMDR. Sometimes a conversation will allow it to move over. Sometimes um, just thinking about it will allow it to move over. But enjoying it, drawing it out. Yeah. The it, ITR but, method where Dr. Lewis Tinnin, you draw it and it goes into that where it's supposed to get to. So those are the two things I think are, are, are most important for people um, who don't, that, that's my, the most helpful contribution I can make for people. For people okay, um, so Howard Lipke, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.